Hello everybody, in this video I'll be showing you a VI I created which is used to process uh, joystick inputs. It doesn't necessarily have to be a joystick, it could be anything with a single axis or a dual ac analog axis input. That is typical like a you know, joypad, a thumbstick, or a joystick, etc. This VI was made specifically for the first Robotics competition, but it can be ported over to uh, pretty much any platform and any code version. And I'll go over the actual code a little bit later. So let me go ahead and start showing you what I have on here. On the bottom of the display, I just have a graph which will demonstrate the behavior of the different parameters and how the different uh, functions behave. On the right, this is expanded to utilize two axes. Now right here, you could just see a uh, sitting flat and you can see it. I actually have a Xbox 360 controller plugged in and uh, this is uh, pretty much what the thumbstick is. So right now, I move the thumb stick all the way right, all the way up, all the way left, all the way down, and in between, I'm just, you can see I could give it a uh, variable uh, throw, if you will. And I'll show you uh, how it, how this functions with two axes, and then obviously the code at the top. All right, so let me start by saying why I made this thing and why I think it's useful. The main reason why I made this is because when you uh, have a joystick, I got to demonstrate over here, you can see the little... Uh, green arrow that's the input and red is the output uh, right now it's not being processed it's just all to zero but as you can see right in the middle there's a little zone where it's very twitchy and if you're using this to control a robot this can cause your robot to be very sporadic which is very problematic or any other scenarios as you can see there's a right now no dead zone so just a little slightest bit of movement on the actual uh, joystick on the controller will make this jitter as you can see I'm not moving this very much now you'd think programming in dead zone should be pretty easy, but it can be when you do a single axis, but once you expand it out to two axes, you start running into certain issues where if you're trying to go all the way right, but you still have a wide dead zone, it creates cropping of your parameters. They actually lose that slight adjustability, and I'll be showing you how this addresses that. So pretty much, uh, let me get started. On the left side, as you can see, I have uh, the graph and I have uh, one parameter called dead zone and that's is 0 to 1 and this is a double value so it could be 0 0.1, 0 0.15, etc, etc. This enumeration is what the processing type is. Currently it's set to linear and this is pretty much just the default as you can see the uh, input values and the output values. So over, and over, over an input range of negative 1 which is maximum left to 1 which is maximum right your output is negative 1 which is maximum one way and 1 maximum the other way and you can see it's a completely linear, linear relationship where input equals output. And I'll show you the different types in a second. I have a parameter on here called uh, n to the power of x, which is unbounded. This means it could be any value. There's no set limit, uh, except it can't be negative. I guess I should note that it should be 0 plus. And then a minimum output of 0 to 1. Again, this is a double, which could be 0 0.1 to, well, 0 to 1. The reason this is important is because if you have a mechanism that's not properly censored or that takes a certain amount of force to even move just barely, this is what you would utilize this parameter for. So you'd have to find out on your own how much, what's the minimum value it takes to move a motor. And then whatever that minimum value is, you would set that into this parameter. And then that would make the smallest output, let's say 0 0.01 on the output, would actually move the motor even though a normal value, unprocessed value, wouldn't be able to move it. So whatever the output values would get added to this, and I'll show you the effects. So first, let's start off with explaining what the dead zone is. Now, dead zone, as you can see on the right side, is pretty much to negate this twitchiness. For some mechanism, this twitchiness could be actually very damaging. So let me show you how that works real quick. So let me set the dead zone to 0.1, which is 10%. Now, as you can see, it changed the shape of the parameter. So, on a zero input, it's zero, and the output is flat here, and the output remains zero from negative 0 0.1 to 0 0.1 on the input range. So, when you move the joystick by this margin, you will get no output difference. Let me mirror it over here, and you can see what that does. So now I can see the green arrow is what the input is, and the red arrow is what the output is. And as you can see, as no matter how much the green arrow moves, the red remains at zero. So if this was hooked to a motor, it pretty much wouldn't go anywhere. And the second 
the green arrow reaches past the threshold, which is this inner circle, you can see the label over here. As long as the green, as soon as the green passes that threshold, the red starts incrementing. As you can see, the way I've implemented it is you still retain your full output range. So normally how people implement a dead zone is they just ignore these low values. So that means your output jumps as well. You can't have a very small output when uh, with a typical dead zone implementation. So looking at here, the second it goes above the threshold, the output doesn't jump to there. It actually gets rescaled to utilize your full output range. So right now my difference is my threshold which is 0 0.1 subtracted from my input which is that little tiny margin and what, that's what the output is reflecting. And As you can see as I move out towards the limit it actually catches up to it. So you retain your maximum output value and you retain your minimum output value so you can make it move very slowly and very fast and still have an effective dead zone. Now let me exaggerate this effect so it becomes more obvious what this is actually doing. So let me make this 0 0.5 And now you'll see the output will do nothing until my, the input reaches that threshold. Now this may be useful if you pretty much just want to set a threshold to go left or right pretty much. So nothing, nothing, nothing. And the second it breaches this threshold, it starts increasing. So the second I go over, you can see the output starts moving. The more I move it, the more the output moves. As you see, this type of threshold, as I mentioned before, if this was just ignored, then the output would completely ignore this low range, which is an undesired effect. So as you can see on here, is you still retain your maximum, and you still retain the really low values. The really low values just start right past that threshold. So then 75% on the input would be 50% on the output. It's proportional. And so that's what the dead zone does, and hopefully I've explained that sufficiently. Moving on to the next parameter. The next parameter is the processing type. As you can see currently, it's linear, so let me reset the dead zone. It's like a, so before it gets too confusing uh, putting in all the parameters, I'll demonstrate one parameter time and then I'll start combining them. So as I said before, it's linear. Now you have several options here. You have square root, you have square, and you have n to the power of x. So let's start with square root. Looking at square root, now you can see it's no longer linear. This mode is useful if you want to get more sensitivity on the higher outputs. As you can see, there's a very high output for about 80% of your input range is a high output range. And then towards the center, it doesn't take much input to start giving your high output. Next is, guess the other way, the square. Now you can see the difference between them and they give you complementary effects. This one gives you more sense I guess more sensitivity on the higher outputs and then the square gives you more sensitivity on the lower side. So I can see right now from about zero, negative 0 0.3 to 0 0.3 is relatively low outputs. It goes from negative 1 to about 0 0.1. So if you want a lot more precision at lower speeds you would use this. And if you want the opposite, if you want precision on higher speeds you use that. This should address most needs to some degree, but then I also added something which I don't haven't seen anybody else do, which is this function, which is n to the power of x. Now this gives you complete control of the curve. So if you look at this curve, it looks very similar to the other one, but it's a little bit more curvy, as you'll see in a second here. I can see this is a regular square and this is a little bit more curvy and that this is when this parameter gets utilized this n to the power of x which is unbounded that's what this parameter is so with one you get linear if it's two you get square you can make it three you can make it even ten I don't know why you'd exactly want this but as you can see this is the type of effect it has one nice parameter I found for using some other stuff is 2.5, which is more than uh, the square, but it's not quite as extreme as some of the other ones. And you could go the other way too, so you could go 0 0.5, which is actually the square root. 
I don't know what the Q would be, but you could go 0 0.25, and you could see the effect earlier. This would give you much more precision on the higher outputs, and pretty much <laughs> no precision on the lower inputs. So you, you can't pretty much even control anything between negative 0 0.3 and 0 0.3 on the output. This, the slightest little change in your input will give you a huge difference. Uh, depends on what effect you want. Like I said, all of these things I think will be rather useful depending on your use case scenario. Like I said, you could make this curve to fit however you want. Oh. I guess that wouldn't work, would it? <laughs> Let me go back to linear. Now let me show you the last parameter, which is the minimum output. As I was saying before, is certain mechanisms when attached to motors require a minimum amount of force. This can be resolved one of a few ways. One way is to do it with an actual speed sensor. So you use a sensor to detect speed and you use that as your feedback loop. But sometimes you don't want to or have that sensor. So an easy way to get around that issue is by using this implementation. This means that if you're going to set any output at all, it's going to be at least the minimum output. So if a motor takes at least a value of 0 0.15 to move, then you would set this here. And then as I just demonstrate, your output immediately jumps to 0 0.15 or negative 0 0.15. So you can't put an output range that's smaller than this. And like I said, this is very useful if you have a certain amount of force just to move the motor, and that's what you would set this to. And then the output is scaled accordingly, so you still retain your full input range, as you can see from negative 1, 1 to 1, 1, and you have all output values from 1 to 0 0.15, and zero, negative 0 0.15 to negative 1 because you set this over your entire input range. So even the smallest input would give you a moving motor. Now I could start showing you how I combine these things. So with the minimum output, you could also give it a dead zone, for example, and then you get something like this. Now this may look a little bit weird, but <laughs> bear with me for a second. As you were as you saw earlier, the dead zone is this flat spot. So that means over an input range of negative 0 0.15 to 1 .5, 0 0.15 on the input, the output will do absolutely nothing. And the second you give it an input that's just outside the dead zone, it will start making a motor move and it's going to jump to that minimum required value. And then the rest of the way is calculated to whatever the function this is. And like I so said, you can mix and match these any way you want. So here's another example. So this is n to the power of x square or square root. As you can see, it looks a little bit funky, but this retains your the effect you're looking for. So do nothing while the controller is in the dead zone, and then after it gets out to the dead zone, make the minimum value whatever it takes to move, and then ramp up the rest of the way accordingly. As you can see, you still retain the full ranges on both. Now that I've shown you what it, <clears throat> the effects are on a single axis, I could show you what all the effects are on the dual axis and the different ways it'll affect your robot and uh, another parameter which you get on the two axes, which is this angular offset. This actually is interesting. This is strictly for a demonstration purposes to show you the effects and for developing purposes. Now let me move on to the next one. Now on the right, I've shown you this earlier with uh, the dead zone, now let me add some other stuff. So I'll make the dead zone 30%. Let me make the, let's start it off with square, square root. Love you being a little bit slow on me, bear with me. All right, so we have a dead zone 0 0.3 and we have a square function and no minimum output. Now let's see how this behaves. So right now I'm pushing the D-pad straight up. And as you see, the second gets above 0 0.3, the red starts moving. And you can see by the end you max it out, it catches up. But as you can see, it's not a linear interpolation anymore. It's hard to see on here without that uh, graph. You could you clearly see what the effect is on the graph, but on here it's much harder to tell because uh, you don't have a constant uh, time interval. But as you could be able to tell, you have more precision on the high end and less on the low end. 
but again you still have the slow spot which may not be enough to make the motor move so let me add a minimum to it so let's say it takes a minimum let's say you have a lifter that has to lift something at 10 pounds you need a lot of force just to get it moving now at a minimum of 0 0.3 probably shouldn't be the same as a dead zone let me make the dead zone uh, so let me make the dead zone 0 0.15 Alright, so for 0 0.15, which is around here, it will do nothing. But the second your input goes outside that threshold, your output gets set to that minimum, which is 0 0.3. And as you can see, and then the rest of the way, it gets scaled up. Now this may seem a little bit weird, as if it's not working, but it actually is. So this is the square. So until this, it starts here, and then it has a slow ramp up slow slow and then start speeding up as you can see and it catches it up now let me show you some of the other ones here's square root so past the threshold gets set to 30 and now it's going to move fast and then slow down so you can see it's moving fast fast but then it slows down drastically while the input still has a large way to go so this would be useful if you want a lot of precision on the higher speeds like you can see it very quickly jumps the low speeds and then it slows down and over your remaining input range, you have a lot of precision on your output, as you can see here. All right, let me move on to the next thing. Like I said, uh, this is just a different parameter you can use. And here's linear. Uh, let me reset these. Love you being slow. I'm sorry about that. Remember, this is what a normal is. So whatever your input is, that's what your output is. So there's a lot of different effects you can utilize to your advantage to set up the manipulation however you desire. All right, now let me mention uh, what this last parameter is, which is the angular offset. Now, as you can see here, whatever the input angle is, your output angle is the same, and so forth, and that's pretty much the case for all of them. Now, this is used for several different things. One thing it can be used for is if you have the motors mounted in the wrong pattern if you will or the robot goes left when you go forward you could actually use this to compensate for it so let me put something like 90 degrees so now when you press forward the output vector is actually 90 degrees out of phase and you could do the same thing going the other way or any angle in between it could be negative 180 to 180 or 0 to 360 actually it could be any angle because the functions actually do the good modulus calculation on it automatically I guess if you will so here's 180 so now when you go forward the robot is told to go backwards now this may be a desired effect if the robot is facing away from you this is one way to use this the other way to use this which is extremely useful is if you use a gyroscope a compass or an IMU if you use any of those sensors the robot can automatically compensate for its orientation. And what I mean by that is, however the robot boots up, it's going to take a zero reference heading and use that as your zero. So as you, let me reset this and I'll show you. So you're telling the robot to go forward, correct? And the robot will go forward. Now, if this was a gyro reading, what would happen if the robot starts turning to, let's say the right, let's say it goes 15 degrees to the right. And look what just happened. So if the robot is going 15 degrees to the right, the robot is told to go 15 degrees to the left. So you take 15 degrees to the right offset, plus your sensor, which would tell you what it is, you add them together, and your result will be zero. So even if your robot starts drifting sideways, if you tell it to go straight on the joystick, the robot will remain, maintain its course and go away from the driver. For example, you tell it to go, let me give you another example you tell the robot to go forward and all of a sudden what happens if the robot is backwards so the sensor your gyro or your compass tells you the robot is backwards and you get this inverted output vector now you may think this is telling the robot to go backwards to you but it's really not so if you're the driver and you're pointing away from you which is the green line and the robot is telling being told to go backwards but the robot is already backwards that means this vector would be telling the robot to move forward relative to you 
So with a gyro on there or a compass or any other type of angular measurement system, the robot can automatically maintain its orientation. So wherever you push the joystick, that's the way the robot will go regardless of how it's facing. So if you're telling it to go right, but the robot is facing left, it'll go right or etc cetera, etc. Cetera. We've used this type of system on our robots for the past few years and it works amazingly well. I don't have really any video of it, but uh, I'll get some video later on once I uh, get it going as well as I want it to. Like I said, uh, we're still in the prototype stage. It's still not driving around, but we should be able to get that soon. But pretty much as you can see, this is what the code does. And I'll go over what it actually is on the top for those curious. If you're not curious in this, you can stop watching. You can just use the VI. But here I'm about to explain what the code actually is and how it works. So as you can see on the top left, I just have all the inputs. I have the enumeration type. I have x n to the power of x, which is my parameter for the function. There's your x, y, which is just the uh, joystick inputs. There's the dead zone value. There's the minimum output, which is 0 to 1, and the angular offset. Now I've labeled these, so if you want to take the time and try to go through them yourself, you can. But I'll just go through them uh, and see if uh, you guys need help. Just post and I'll uh, try to help you. So the first thing we do <clears throat> is we have to calculate the vector. So this top block calculates the vector's magnitude. So you take, uh, which is just Pythagorean theorem, you take your x squared, y squared, add them, and take the square root of that. Now I have this additional little function here which takes the minimum of x and 1. All this does is it uh, concatenates the value to a maximum value of 1. <clears throat> the reason I do this is to normalize the vector. If I don't do this, then unless the joystick is perfectly manufactured or has a perfect driver, then you'll get weird values and it won't work as you expect. It won't have a normalized output. We're expecting a normalized vector and that's what this is going to do. It's going to make the maximum magnitude for any given values of x and y be 1 which is what you see on this graph here. You can see how it's following this radius that's capping it. Without that, it actually squares off these edges a little bit, which is not desired for this case. If it was completely square, you could uh, compensate for that and turn that back into a circle, but because it's not perfectly square, it's semi-square with kind of squared off, semi-circular with squared off edges, I just concatenated it to 1, which gives me a normalized vector. And then the block underneath it is just calculate the vector angle. So take your x component, y component, and get your output. The next block up here is subtract the dead zone, rescale to maintain fall output range. So it takes your magnitude, it subtracts the dead zone, which gives you a certain range. That's going to be your input range. Now from that range, you divide it by whatever the 1 minus the dead zone is. This will scale your input range back to 1. So the output here the maximum output range rather will be back to one here. That's how you maintain, uh, that's how you don't lose that uh, range in the dead zone is because you have to rescale it and that's what I did here. Next I have a function block for all the different implementations of all the different functions. So here's linear. Linear just passes it straight through. No special processing, processing required. For square root, well I take the square root of it. Pretty obvious. For the square, I square and then for n to the power of x, I just have the n to the power of x function. So you could add as many different uh, implementations as you want, but I think these are pretty good for pretty much anything FRC related. The next block says rescale to maintain full input range and add to the minimum output. So this does a similar function to what this did, but it's kind of reverse. I have a input scale that's too big, and here I'm reducing it. So if my minimum output is 0 0.1, that means I want my input here to only be 0 0.9. So I take my range, which is 0 to 1, multiply it by whatever the difference between 1 and that is, which gives me a scaling factor, and then I multiply by that scaling factor, I get my value, which is going to be 0 through 0 0.9 here, plus 0 0.1, which means my output is going to be from 0 0.1 up to, well, 1 next block block is uh, check if the input is greater than the dead zone so pretty much take your magnitude if your magnitude is bigger than your threshold pass the value through if it's not make it zero so pretty much that's how I set 
50 values by using this little block. Pretty much if the magnitude is less than the threshold, just make the output zero, ignore whatever the value is. And then the next block, it's not necessarily in order as you can see, is to extract the x and y components of the vector. Now, as you can see, I have an arctan function and then I split it back up here. Now, why did I do it this way? Why didn't I just use x and y? Well, because of this thing down here, as you can see, I add the angular offset, which can come from a gyro compass IMU for dynamic orientation compensation or a hard offset if, uh, like I said, when you push forward or what goes sideways or things along those lines. So I took, calculated the angle, converted it to degrees, added the uh, offset, whatever you want the offset to be, back to radians, and then I got uh, X and Y components back out of it. So doing it in these three steps, so get the angle, offset the angle, get the components back, allows you to compensate for a shift, if you will. And uh, like I said, this is why I did it this way, and why I have these three steps. All right, the next step is uh, scale components by desired magnitude. So the sine and cosine are always gonna be a value of zero to one, regardless of what your input is, it's gonna be an angle. So now we wanna scale those values back by our magnitude, which is the output from here. So all of this processing is done to figure out the magnitude you want. The angle doesn't have much. In fact, unless we, if we didn't want this angular compensation, we don't even need to calculate the angle and we don't need to calculate the components, we just use X and Y. But because we want this angular offset capability, we do this and then we multiply that output by the magnitudes. So at this point, you have a vector at a given angle at a given magnitude, a desired and calculated vector and magnitude rather. And then I have uh, this little block here which just calculates the new angle. So taking all that into account, it just tells you what the angle is. Now this isn't really necessary, I just do this to give you an extra output so you don't have to recalculate it later. So your outputs are your x, your y, the vector magnitude, and the vector angle. Now you're usually only going to use two out of these four at any time unless you want to use those for whatever other reason. So you can use x and y components to drive x and y of the robot directly or you can use magnitude and angle if you want to stick it in some more processing or if you have different ways to process it. So that's pretty much the code. I think it'll be rather useful. I know we'll be using it and feel free to use it however you please. Just give, leave my little uh, credit notation here and I'll uh, See you guys next time. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching.